material and we're going to do it in an hour. And our part of the bargain is we're going to not go off on tangents and rant as much as we normally would. And in return, we ask that you save your questions to the end and hopefully we won't go over time and we actually will have time for questions. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, I'm Jess Humble, uh, I work for Thought Work Studios, uh, I was the co-author of this book and my job is to rant at people. Um, and I'm Bhattarajal Janak Raman, uh, I work at Studios as well. Um, I'm a developer, uh, well, recently I've been playing more of a product owner role but that's just the past few months. Um, I've been with ThoughtWorks for about uh, 11 years now and most of that I've been doing code, writing code as either a Java or a Ruby developer. I'm working with some pretty big, hairy automation test suites as a part of that, so that's me. And come and sit at the front, and then we don't have to chat so loud. So, um, we'll probably just talk a bit loud. Yeah. Um, so, we're going to talk today about how to create high quality acceptance tests, uh, but more importantly, how to make your acceptance test suite maintainable. Because it's one thing to create acceptance test suites, making, keeping them maintainable over time a reasonable cost is the hard bit, it turns out. And all <coughs> problems ultimately, the, the practices and principles to achieve this are well known, but they're hard. And what particularly is difficult is cultural stuff and team stuff, so we'll be addressing that because that's really important. And then finally there'll be a section on managing test data because test data is often complex and poorly understood. So if you only take away four things today, they should be this. Quality is everybody's responsibility. The quality is not the responsibility of the testers, it's everyone's responsibility. Um, test suites that are maintainable are created and curated continuously by developers and testers and customers, in fact, working collaboratively throughout the life cycle of the project. You need to treat your test code with the same love and care and attention as your production code. And finally, taking story level tests and automating them is not a good basis for creating a suite of maintainable automated acceptance test suites. So, uh, who's seen this diagram? Okay, a few of you. So, Brian Marrick dis divided tests up along two axes, whether they support programming or whether they critique the project on one axis, on the other axis whether they're technology facing and business facing and all the kinds of tests you could possibly run fall into this quadrant. So at the bottom left, technology te facing tests that support programming are your unit tests, your system tests. These are tests written by developers to validate that the system, that the code they are writing behaves in the way they expect. And the only way that I know to create maintainable suites of unit tests is through test driven development. This stuff should all be automated. On the top right are the things that your human beings should be doing. Uh, showcases, demonstrations, getting feedback from your users and your customers, usability testing, <coughs> exploratory testing. This is what testers should be doing. That and creating, helping to create and maintain uh, acceptance tests. This can't be automated. On the top left is uh, what we call functional acceptance tests. So these are end-to-end -end tests that run in a production-like environment that simulate the paths of users interacting with the system. So their journeys, uh, you know, complete business flows like buying a book on a uh, flip card or something. Uh, so this can and should all be automated as well. It's hard, but, and that's the main subject of today. So we're kind of not gonna be talking about the rest of this stuff very much. And then at the bottom right is what's laughingly called non-functional <laughs> Uh, acceptance tests, so things like performance, scalability, availability, uh, security, um, all these other kinds of illity type concerns, and a lot of this can be automated. It's insufficiently done, and it's insufficiently tested from the beginning. This is how we validate our system <coughs> architecture, and we need to be doing this from the beginning of development because that's when it's actually cheap to change the architecture. So, we're going to ignore the right-hand side completely from now on and focus on the left-hand side. And in terms of these types of tests, there's something called the uh, test pyramid that Mike Cohen talks about. <coughs> and what he says is, in your test suites, there should be a very large number of unit tests, which test a single class or function in isolation, and they run very, very fast, and you have a lot of them. In the middle, you should have a smaller number of service level tests. And these are end-to-end -end functional acceptance tests, but they go through the service layer. 
And then at the top, you have an even lesser number of UI tests, which again are end-to-end -end, uh, functional acceptance tests, but they run through the UI. And if you design your tests right, you can use the same test suites and run them either through the service layer or the UI layer. We'll be talking about that later. <coughs> the important thing to take away from this, uh, and if you look at this in terms of um, the, the quadrant diagram I just showed you, you can kind of collapse these. Uh, what you really want is a lesser number of end-to-end -end business facing tests and a large number of localized technology facing tests. And the important thing about the pyramid is there's more of these than there are of these. What you want to avoid is the inverted pyramid where you have uh, a ton of acceptance tests and not very many or no unit tests. And that's a common failure mode that we see. People use some horrible tool like QTP to record uh, record and playback based acceptance tests and they don't have any unit tests and then what you find is these recorded acceptance tests fail all the time and they're flaky and they're very expensive to maintain but it's your only protection against bugs and so that becomes inordinately painful and horrible. So we're going to present six principles. Uh, principle zero uh, because we're all zero indexed here, of course. Uh, <laughs> writing good acceptance tests is hard. So we all know this, that's why we're here. Uh, the important thing to consider is what do we mean by good? And I think there's two elements to that. Number one, when the tests are green, we are confident that the software is working. So a good test suite, when it passes, you have some confidence you could actually release that to your users. Conversely, if the test suite is red, you have some confidence that there's actually a bug. Not that the tests are flaky or the environment isn't set up right or some other problem like that. So you want to know, test suite goes green, great, I can release. Test suite goes red, oh, there's a problem I need to investigate. Yeah. And that's the sign of a good suite. Yeah, and ultimately this turns out to be um, the thing that distinguishes uh, a good test suite from ones that are hard to maintain and difficult to maintain. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you've got a pyramid or a pear or an apple-shaped test suite. That, that, I mean, it's important to achieve that as a sort of platonic ideal, but that is not what you're really working towards. You're not working towards making your test suite go into a pyramidal shape. What you're working towards is this level of confidence, and then you can then optimize the test suite that results and gives you this level of confidence um, into that sort of platonic ideal of a pyramid in order to get the benefits that you um, get when you do that. Um, so, to give you to give you an example of um, yes, it's hard to write acceptance test suites, but it's also false to state that large-scale acceptance test suites cannot be written, maintained, and evolved over a period of time with an application that's currently in production as well. Uh, this is the application Mingle. I work in studios. One of the products we have is called Mingle. It's a web-based uh, uh, project management tool, um, and. Uh, and, and, and this app, we started it in 2006. It was a really tiny team. We were practically in startup mode. We started with about 20 tests on day one, uh, 500 lines of code in the test suite, and the whole suite ran in about two minutes. Um, uh, fast forward to 2012, the, uh, we probably need to update these numbers for 2013 because I'm giving this talk now. Um, we, are, we are at about uh, 3,000 uh, acceptance tests. They uh, are about 50k lines of code and they take about 12 hours if you run them from end to end. And these tests have run every single day from the day we started writing them in September to, of 2006 till today. And they have lasted us through uh, an office move from Sydney to Beijing and from Beijing to San Francisco and three office moves in San Francisco. So through all this, this suite has actually stayed alive and running, uh, running on different machines. Um, the actual running time for this 12-hour suite is actually 55 minutes, which we achieved by parallelizing our test suite. Uh, they run about seven to ten times a day. We obviously check in a lot more frequently than that, but then the check-ins get patched up and they run about ten times a day. Um, they've been running for about six years across multiple offices and they are still running. Uh, so if somebody tells you that you can't actually grow a test suite and keep it running over multiple years, they're lying. You can do it, it just takes a lot of work. And I would want to add, um, there's a guy called Gary Groover who worked at HP on the LaserJet firmware team. Uh, he's written a book called A Practical Approach to Large-Scale Agile Development, published by Addison Wesley. So what they did, this is for HP LaserJet firmware. They created a suite of several thousand acceptance tests that run on logic boards that simulate the printer. So they actually 
deploy the firmware to the logic boards, start the logic boards, <coughs> run the acceptance tests against the lo logic boards. Uh, they have thousands of tests that they run, and if the tests fail, the change that caused the test to run is reverted automatically from version control. So anyone who says you can't write end-to-end -end acceptance tests in, say, embedded systems, um, you know, show them this book. I actually bought this book so I could spank people who say you can't do acceptance <laughs> testing on embedded systems, or my system can't be acceptance tested. Any system can be acceptance tested if you design it in such a way that it can be acceptance mm -hmm. tested. So don't believe that it's not possible. It's absolutely possible. So what do people mean when they uh, typically say that my application can't be tested or the street is flaky? Um, so they mean that their acceptance test suite has decayed. It has undergone a, a, a sort of um, diffusion. The purpose of what the test suite is and what it states is not quite clear anymore. And why do these suites decay? Well, they decay for the exact same reasons that your production code does. If there was nobody actually taking care of your production code, it would decay in exactly the same way that your test suites do. You don't pay enough attention to expressing the intent in the test suites. You're, if you pay more attention to making sure that a particular link with a particular rel type and class is clicked every time you land up on a page, that does not express the intent of what the user is trying to accomplish. That is somebody trying to uh, assert the mechanics of how the user goes about doing this action. So if tomorrow you decide, or a UX person comes in, decides your company needs a new coat of paint, and says that all these links are going to become buttons, and if you think, oh my god, we can't do that because we've got 3,000 tests that are now going to fail, you've done a bad job. So that cannot be, uh, uh, you should not be in a position where that becomes a problem. Um, and only testers care about maintaining tests. If test suites and the maintenance of test suites is relegated to a department that you hopefully never see, uh, probably works on a different floor, and God forbid works on a different continent in a different time zone, and you just write the code and throw the code over to them and expect them to validate it, and they are the ones who are responsible for maintaining a test suite, forget it, it's never gonna happen. I think the important point to bear in mind is that, we'll come to this later. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> so, now we start from the real principles, because uh, we're starting from principle number one at this point. And uh, so uh, the, the, this brings us to principle number one, which is that tests are actually first class citizens of your project. Um, tests deserve, what do we mean by this? We mean that um, tests are uh, deserve the same kind of care, curation, um, and dedication that you would give to writing your production code. So you would not design, poorly designed objects and, uh, and throw in <coughs> random willy-nilly strings running about the place without consolidating uh, pieces of repeated code. So if you wouldn't do that in your production code because that leads to diffusion of intent in your production application, the exact same problems can happen over here as well and you need to prevent that from happening in your test code base. Yeah, so, yeah? So suppose the automated tests are written sometimes later than the software. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that. And actually, I, let's take questions at yeah. the end, otherwise okay, we have let's, let's do that. Okay. If it's not answered by the end, then please ask again. Okay, sure. So, as I was mentioning, you need to treat uh, test code as production code. Um, you need to refactor relentlessly. Refactoring is not something you do for just your production code. It's not something that developers do because they've got access to IntelliJ or ReSharper. Refactoring is a, is a way of working where you consciously take very small behavior preserving transformations to make the system capable of accepting change and then put in change. You need to refactor your test code as you refactor your production code. Um, do not repeat yourself. This is the death knell of any code base. If there is duplicated uh, intent anywhere in your system, one of them is going to decay and that one will start failing mysteriously and you will not know how to uh, handle it. And this is one of the reasons we don't like FIT, um, because in FIT it's very hard to extract out um, repetition. Um, oh. Uh, that's a mini joke. That's a little joke. <laughs> <laughs> laugh, laugh. <laughs> Great. Uh, we didn't think we were going to get many opportunities for joking about test suites, so we just threw that one in there. So, uh, do not use record and playback tools to build your entire test suite. Um, this does not mean that you can't use record and playback tools. They, there is value in them. Sometimes you want to know how to actually go about this flow. You want to know what a particular selector is. You want to know how to actually click that button, what event is actually triggered. By all means, run it once, see what it does, copy the code, and then just put that one little snippet into the place where it belongs, scaffold it with uh, the right level of abstraction that you need. So use it to record little snippets, and then put a, a scaffold around those snippets as either a method or a class or a page object or something of that sort, and we'll get to all of these patterns later, uh, in order to build the rest of your suite. And what you find if you create suites entirely using record and playback is they're really, really brittle. You change a UI element or you move a UI element and suddenly all your acceptance tests fail and you need to re-record them. 
and that it's just death. Yeah. And that's why QTP. No, anyone using QTP? Okay, stop doing okay. it. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll stop trying to bash what you do on a day-to-day -day, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but um, just just we're we're just letting you know that we feel your pain. Uh, yeah, we're trying <laughs> to em empathise. Maybe not doing it very well. <laughs> um, preventing decaf intention. So those things were prevent. Uh, so. The, the, previous step, the previous points I mentioned were about how you could prevent decay or uh, diffusion in the mechanics of what the test actually does. How do you prevent decay of actual intentions so or what your test suite is actually talking about? So before I talk about this, a quick step back. Let me talk about what is intention and what's mechanics. <coughs> intention is what your user is trying to accomplish. It is a statement of what the user is trying to achieve by going through your system. Mechanics is how they actually go about doing it, clicking on the login link, making sure that they can see a particular tab, clicking on that tab, getting on the right sidebar and clicking the fourth link down there, filling out some form fields. Those are the mechanics. What the user is trying to do at that point is make a purchase. So <coughs> making a purchase on your system is the intention. The mechanics of how you go about it are the actual manual steps that you follow. So we just talked about how you can prevent intention and mechanics, which is the code aspect, the, the mundane, repetitive, uh, imperative, one after the other aspect of it. And now to talk about preventing DK and the intention of your test suite, um, given when then is insufficient. So it is not that it's, it's a bad idea to start your tests out with a given when then format. But it's insufficient because then you end up trying to shoehorn every single requirement into that format regardless of whether it fits or not without really paying attention to whether it actually makes sense in this particular context. So use it as a guide but don't try to force yourself to write every single test in that form. And that's true of all the agile things like the story format yeah. and you know, their exactly. starting points. Yeah, uh, the as a so that I can format. If you try to write every story like that, you'll probably never write um, a, a performance story or a story that says my system should run for three months without crashing with an out of memory error because which customer is going to come and tell you that I don't want it to crash on April 31st with an out of memory error. So there are some things that you should not do and you should not slavishly follow any pattern and slavishly <coughs> following the given when then pattern can be bad as well. Uh, separate intention from mechanics, so the things that I was talking about, the mechanics of how somebody accomplishes something versus what they are trying to accomplish. In all likelihood, even if you move <coughs> from a web-based client to a rich client or convert the other way around, which is more likely, um, you'll probably still be having a system in which your customers can place orders. So the intention that the customer is going to place orders in your system is still likely going to be valid. The mechanics of how they're going to do about it can change with a UI coat of paint, it can change with whether you're using a rich client or not. And all of these things can switch. And you want to be able to take these things that have differing rates of change and express them separately. So you want to separate your intention from your mechanics. People could be using uh, a web browser. They could be using a service layer to do it. Yep. It's another or an API. Or they could an be API. doing a RESTful API. Yeah, or they could be using their iPhone. Exactly. Um, and finally, you need to express your test as the steps of a user's journey. Uh, a user's journey is a sequence of actions that they do that represents a meaningful <coughs> outcome from a customer's perspective. This is not, this is not from a story perspective saying, um, I need this link to be present here so that I can do these few things in the future. So it's not about that sort of granular level. It's about when mm -hmm. a user enters the system, when they stay in your system logged in for about 15 to 20 minutes, what is the operation they're doing? What are the few operations they perform? And you need to express your intention in that format. Yes. Got fancy animations. Um, <laughs> right. So here's a solution that we propose. Uh, mm -hmm. Use a natural language to express intentions, because that's the best language for expressing user intentions. Uh, my customer places an order. Better said that way than by put, uh, inserting arbitrary periods in there to make some object-oriented language feel happy. Um, use a general purpose programming language to express test mechanics. These have proven their value. We know where their value is. We know what Java, Ruby, Smalltalk can do for us. So use a general purpose language to express the test mechanics of clicking in one place or filling out a form field. And use a tool that allows you to operate in either domain seamlessly. You need to have a tool which allows you to author your tests and as intentions. Uh, express your mechanics. Can you elaborate Yeah, so, yep. so you wanna, we said you have to treat your test code like production code. So what that means is you have to refactor it, you have to be able to remove duplication, you need to be able to do uh, encapsulation, <laughs> separation of concerns. So you need a programming language to do that. You can't do that in um, uh, kind of a natural language or a made up language and you need an IDE which is designed to allow you to do that. So if you're going to treat your production co test codes with the same way you treat your, your test code the same way you treat your production code, you need to be able to manage it using the same way you would manage production code.
So the benefits of the toolings that you get for writing production code should also be available to express to for your test mechanics themselves. And since they are treated identically, you want to use the same tool chain in order to do that. And you want to use a tool chain that allows you to switch between those two, saying when you're talking about intention, you can see that as natural language expressions. And when you actually move over into mechanics, you can actually see those as well. Um, if only such a tool existed, Budgery. Yeah. Oh, wow. What well, do you know? We have one. Um, so I don't want this to become a product demo, but um, this is just one of the tools out there. Uh, this is a tool that we've developed in studios called Twist. And I'm showing you um, the execution of Twist test suite. Um, I don't know if people at the back can see, but this is basically a test suite that's actually written in a natural language, and it's testing a real application that we have internally. Uh, so you see the intentions are expressed in pure English, whereas um, the implementation obviously navigates through a web browser. You don't see a browser.click anywhere over here, but all of that is happening behind the scenes. So, And that's because each of these steps is actually implemented as a series of browser automation steps using a browser automation framework, but that is not the way we actually encode the intention of what the test is trying to say. So if we want to go to a listing of all user members, perform some searching and verify that some users are there, we do that using the intention uh, language, not using the language of mechanics. So what's happening here is each of these steps here is actually calling a method um, with the same name as the, the uh, thing, but it's all kind of concatenated. And what the tool does is it keeps the, the, um, the steps in sync with the code. So if I rename the method, it renames the steps. If I rename the steps, it renames the methods. It keeps everything in sync. I can put, I can extract um, stuff out and remove duplication. And most importantly, I can press an execute button here, and that will actually <coughs> run each of these methods in order. Yeah. Um, so this is based on Eclipse. There's tools out there that let you do it, like Cucumber. Cucumber lets you do exactly very similar stuff. Cucumber lets you do very, very similar stuff. Um, each of these tools have got their own pluses and minuses, but they are come at the problem from the same place. They want you to talk about what your intention of your test is uh, in natural language, and then separate it out from the implementation. So that's the end of the product, I think. Yeah. Uh, another thing that you can do is the page object. How many people are familiar with this pattern, the page object pattern? It's a way to uh, encapsulate each page in your application so that um, the <coughs> operations that can be performed on that particular page are available as abstractions on the object that represents the page. Uh, so for example, if you've got a login page and if you can log in uh, with, with a set of credentials, uh, you'd create a page object that represents the login page, and you'd have methods on it such as login as, and inside that method, you'd be able to do the mechanics of filling in those form fields and hitting the submit button. You do not let those series of four uh, steps leak out all the way uh, into your application code or into your test suite code. And this way, um, when you need to understand how to log in, there is one place in the code base that tells you explicitly how logging in in the system happens. And if you ever change it, there's only one place to change it. So there isn't that sort of diffusion where it starts, sort, of, sort of starts spreading. Um, and this is an example of how you can expect errors and things of that sort. So in, uh, the other interesting thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh, typically page objects return other page objects. So if upon successful completion you go navigate away from your login page to a home page, uh, then uh, you see that the login as method actually returns a home page object. And you would therefore sequence your user journeys by sequencing a uh, sequence of <coughs> actions on these page objects, each of which would return a proxy to a new uh, location in your application. So the, the top layer of your test code doesn't know how to interact with the system under test. It calls <laughs> methods in the page object. So you would, if you wanted, if you had code which like logged in as a user, that would call the login as method on the login page and supply the username and password. And this actually is what interacts with the browser. So all the information, this has the Selenium objects in it. All the information on how to actually interact with the system is encapsulated in the page object. So as Budgie says, if I change the UI element, I only need to, um, ex to tell the test suite about it in this one place where that encapsulation <coughs> with that UI element happens. Yeah. Now, the nice thing about this is it allows us to use the same test suite um, to interact with, say, a graphical user interface or the service interface or even an iPhone client. Because what I can do is I can turn this class into an interface. And then I can have different <coughs> implementations of that interface. I can have a set of implementations that interact with the GUI. I can have a set of implementations that interact with the service API. I can have a third set of implementations that interact with the iPhone <coughs> client. And what that means is I can switch out a runtime. I can use the same test suite and say, OK, now I'm going to run it against the, uh, the iPhone version of the app just by changing out which actual implementations I inject at runtime for the test suite. So it's very, very powerful as a way of reusing your test suite. Yep. But, but only those classes um, need to be changed, right? Yes. So, well, 
all of the page objects, so this, this particular class knows how to interact with the login page. General. You need one of these classes for each one of the pages. Yeah, on all the abstractions that are globals, uh -huh. you, you don't have to change those, right? This yep. is the bottom level. This is the lowest level of abstraction that you would typically find, because okay. below this you call framework code by calling in something like Selenium. But it calls other objects, right? Those this, are no, this only calls <coughs> the, uh, the your driver. Auto your automation framework, whatever your automation framework driver is. So if you've got a Frankenstein driver, or if you've got a Selenium driver or a web driver, this just makes calls onto the driver. But For example, you see the browser over here? All, these, all that this method does is call methods onto the driver in order to automate whatever uh, whatever UI you're using, either a browser or um, or a rich client, and then it finishes that operation and it returns a new page object to you. So all you're doing here is interacting with the driver to drive the system under test. The advantage is that this stays stable, and then your level of intentions does not change every time your mechanics change. So if you instead of changing a making it a link, you made it a button, or if it happened to over Ajax all of that would affect only this one place, not the place that was actually trying to log in as a precursor to finishing the rest of your user journey. So you're saying you inject the right driver based on, you know, what... That's one way to do it. If yeah. you wanted to swap drivers out, you could do it with just a regular... GUI or an iPhone, as you said. So instead of the Selenium session, you use something else. Exactly. So you have, I mean, you have an interface to login page, exactly. yeah. and then you have a class which would be um, a Selenium, Selenium login page, right. and then you have another implementation which would be iPhone login page, and the third one which would be API login page. Yes. Yeah, and that's the same thing for each of the interfaces for each of the pages. So essentially, strategy per device or per whatever. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Essentially, and it's the sort of thing that you get with. If you're using Capybara plus Cucumber, you'd get this. You could just swap out the driver at runtime with an annotation, and it would just run in a different driver. So this is the pattern. There are multiple implementations. So you can use dependency injection, basically. Yeah, you could use like Pico or Nano to inject stuff over here. Um, and that brings us. So that is about how you can actually structure the mechanics of your tests and separate uh, intention from mechanics. And Jess was going to talk about uh, how to actually go about creating these suites. So I'm going to now talk about the team dynamics in terms of how we create and maintain acceptance test suites and hopefully address your question. So the idea is this. In the life cycle of a story, first you, you, you write what, uh, how to solve a customer problem and uh, you need to work out acceptance criteria for that story. How will we know when we are done with this story? Uh, and that involves the customer and the tester, or the analyst and the tester, working together in order to work out what the acceptance criteria are. So that's decided by the customer and the tester working together. And then you actually play the story. Now, we believe that you should write unit tests first as you implement code, so TDD. But the acceptance tests, we're not religious. You can either write the acceptance tests before you write the code, or you can write the acceptance tests after you write the code. It's fine. And with Twist and uh, Cucumber, what you can do is you can write the natural language expression in the tool, but those methods don't actually do anything. There's nothing behind it, so they just all pass automatically. So you can write those beforehand, <coughs> the natural language acceptance criteria in the tool, before you play the story, and then after you play the story, typically, you'll write the implementations. Mm -hmm. um, and so the implementations need to be written by developers and testers pairing. And we actually think that developers and testers should physically pair to write that, because testers may not be technical, and that's fine. We don't say that all testers should be experts in test automation, but, and that's why they would pair with a developer who knows how to actually write the code, but they may not understand very much about things like exploratory testing and um, how the test suite is organized. So actually have them pair together to write the test implementation. And the dynamics of this will change with the evolution of the system. When you're working on a new system, you're going to have to do a lot of writing of test implementations. With an older system, what you'll find is that a lot of the page objects and the mechanics are already there. So you don't need to write a lot of new code to implement a new test. You'll just be reusing existing stuff generally. And if that's not the case, you probably have a reuse problem. Um, but So then this is done by the developers and testers. Uh, typically, the implementation is after the story is played. So that's kind of the life cycle of how you actually write the acceptance tests. So I just want to talk a little bit about the role of the tester, um, because kind of tester is a bit of a misunderstood role. Um, and it is a role, it's not a person. So famously, Google doesn't have people who are called testers. The engineers are responsible for writing the tests for their code. So they play the tester role. Um, 
So you don't necessarily need to have someone who's called a tester. You can have people who are part-time testers. The important thing is to have that role and that skill on your team. Um, and the other terrible mistake that people make is that they consider that testers are somehow failed developers. Uh, you know, there's a myth that if you're not smart enough to become a developer, that you're... Somehow you, you will be smart enough to create a test suite that's maintainable. Right. Yeah, because that's really easy. <laughs> so um, our strong belief is that uh, testers have a complementary set of skills which uh, are just as hard. I mean, uh, it's like... They're harder. I don't find very many good testers. In fact, good testers are a rarity. They're even harder to find than good developers. Uh, good developers, you can read every single one of Don Knuth's books and become a really good developer. Well, if you're if you have time and if you're smart enough to find a good tester, you need a person who's like naturally really, really smart and gets the internals of how systems work and where breaking points are. And those people are really hard to find. There, there's that famous quote that if you're if you write the clever cleverest code you possibly can, then by definition you're, you're not, not smart enough to debug it. Yes. Yeah. Right. I believe it's the same thing with tests, out. right? <laughs> Actually, when you do TDD, what you find is the hard part is writing the test. Once you've written a good unit test, writing the implementation is the easy bit. It's actually the thinking and the design of the test suite that turns out to be the hard bit in writing the good systems. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the job of the tester is not to uh, be the person who decides the quality of the system. The role of the tester is to be the user advocate. They're the person that represents the user and how the user will interact with the system. And to make the quality of the system transparent so that the team can make decisions about the quality of the system. If your testers are primarily working on manual regression testing, you have a problem. Neil Ford, who's <laughs> speaking here today, has a joke that when human beings do the things that computers could be doing instead, all the computers get together late at night and laugh at us. <laughs> and nowhere is that more true than if you have testers doing <clears throat> manual regression testing. This is 2013. We should not have human beings wasting their time doing slavishly repetitive pages of scripts reading pages of scripts and pressing buttons on UIs. I mean, really. Um, they should be focused on exploratory testing and helping to create and maintain suites of automated acceptance tests. Uh, this is what we believe testers should be doing. So, last thing on principle one, passing acceptance tests are necessary conditions for being done. Developers cannot say they are dev complete with a story until they have passing acceptance tests that prove that that story really works on a production-like system. So dev complete is meaningless if you don't have automated acceptance tests, and that's the really important thing. Uh, and that prevents this kind of nasty failure mode where project managers deprioritize the tests mm -hmm. for the functionality. I mean, that, that shouldn't be possible because you can't say you're done until you have the acceptance tests. Um, it's really important to use uh, encapsulation to encapsulate the interaction with the system under test away from the rest of the test suite um, because that's what allows you to get all these nice things like being able to reuse the same test suite for different clients. And also in terms of maintainability and making sure the test suites aren't flaky, if I change a UI element or the test break, well that's fine, I can just update the reference to that UI element, UI element in one place. And then finally, the acceptance tests are everybody's responsibility. The team owns the acceptance test suite, not the testers. So, principle two is that we should, the test suite should always interact with the system under test in the same way that a user would do so. So, more on this point, uh, what do we really mean by this? Um, if you try to take back doors through the system or if there are ways to access the system that are only ever, ever, ever available in uh, test mode and you use those extensively and primarily to test the functionality of your application, um, you're never, you're never going to have anything that tells you whether when you put this in front of a user, it's going to work the same way or not. And if you don't have that guarantee, it just fails the very first criterion for what we said a good acceptance test suite is, which is when it passes, you know that you can actually release it to your customers. And if you don't have that confidence, there's no point spending time building those suites. So people have this notion that browser-based tests are unreliable, and why is that? Um, what do they mean when they say that in the first place? The test fails in CI, but when I run the app, like when I'm actually going through it, it seems fine. So why is it that I can press this button and the page gets submitted, but the, why does the test fail in CI? Or vice versa. Or the other way around. Uh, it's usually an indication that the test mechanics and the user interaction patterns actually differ. Um, so how, can, how could these possibly differ? And we'll be looking into that a little bit further. 
Um, common pattern is Ajax. Uh, so quite often you tend to uh, click a button and you don't realize whether it's a full form submit or whether it's an Ajax submit and whether the page is going to get reloaded or only a small portion of the page is going to come back. And these things tend to cause a lot of flakiness and we'll be talking about how we can handle this. And uh, a JavaScript heavy application in which the actual UI processing time may, may be non-zero. You typically expect the browser to instantaneously have arrived at a complete state, whereas it's not true, with more and more stuff actually becoming the browser's responsibility, including local storage, painting, 3D rendering, JavaScript engines, and working at the blazing speed that they're expected to. Uh, there's a lot of work that they have to do, and there's, a lot, there's quite often a, a significant amount of time that your application spends in the browser, and that's a non-zero time, and you need to account for that while writing your test suites, or else they can become flaky. And this is why you need to have tests that run against the UI. Mm -hmm. If a significant portion of your business <coughs> logic and your domain logic is actually in on the client side, you better have tests that run through the UI. And this is getting more and more true as we write rich JavaScript applications, because, hey, JavaScript is powerful enough to actually merit those kinds of applications being written in at this point. So some solutions to these problems. Uh, test your application the way a user might use it, so don't take shortcuts. Um, what does this actually mean? Uh, understand when behavior is asynchronous and account for it explicitly. Uh, if you've got a JavaScript-based dropdown um, and you're going to click a drop link and the dropdown is going to show up, your user is not going to just click that drop link and instantaneously click on a dropdown value. They're going to wait until that dropdown actually shows up on the page before they navigate to the third item of the list and click it. So if your user is going to do that, think about that process explicitly and encode for it. So when you click the drop link, wait until the drop down is present and third element is visible and then go and click it. And that's just one of the very, very simple examples, but you can use this pattern over and over again. I mean, Any time when you click on an element and that causes, for example, a server side call or something like that, which renders part of the page, I mean, you have to wait for that. Yeah. And counter example, uh, as, as a counter, uh, Countering that, don't use bare sleep. So don't just say, I'm going to click on this drop link and wait for, eh, I don't know, somewhere around three to six seconds. Uh, that is just doomed to fail because at some point in time, your application is going to get slow, there's going to be network congestion, and some, sometime or the other, it's going to take you seven seconds and your test is going to fail. And what happens is people try and get clever and extract that out into a constant. And then, you know, <laughs> and then what happens is the test suite fails, and you're like, well, I'm going to increase the constant that I wait for. Yeah. And then your test suddenly takes much longer to run, and it takes longer and longer and longer to run as you increase the constant yeah. more and Max more. Max wait time stops from 10 seconds and slowly creeps up to 120 seconds by the time you're in the fourth year of your test. And why? Because some tests needed that time. Uh, uh, and if it's hard to write the test... Sorry, and, and so the solution sorry, yeah. to that is to poll. So what you do is you have a loop, and the loop has a delay of like 100 or 10 milliseconds or something, and then after 10 repeats, then it will time out. Yeah. So always poll for wait for things to wait for things to happen yes, rather than waiting. This this kind of exasperates when you have a real-time system, especially. Yes. It just shows up right up well, front. First, first test. Very the systems that have got yeah. For systems right. that have got uh, streaming data streaming or data. sockets yeah. coming through or some sort of comet-like interaction, the actually the patterns get even it's even it's more just, important yeah. to wait for this sort of stuff. Um, and finally, if it's hard to write the test for some reason, um, it's not a reason to write, not write the test or take shortcuts. It's actually a reason to have a conversation with the dev team. Your application should not be untestable from the UI level. Uh, because lack of testability at the UI level means that some visible clue that the user is going to use a uh, need in order to use your application is not available. And if it was available, you'd use it in order to automate your suite. And if it wasn't available, then most likely your user is also going to miss out on those cues. So this is a part of what we were talking about. The, uh, the, one of the roles of the tester is to be an advocate for the user in your system. And this is one way in which they can do it. If they can't automate the suite, your users are probably not going to be able to use your application well either. So this is one of the reasons that it's important for testers and developers to be in the same room. If your testers are in a completely different room, you can't have these conversations. Writing tests impacts your architecture and it impacts the way you design the system. And creating tests for a system should change the design because it's a pressure on the design. Writing tests forces you to do good design. And so if the testers and the developers can't have a conversation, the developers never feel that pressure to create a system which is actually testable. Yep. And then that just creates a horrible feedback loop, which creates horrible unmaintainable code, which is then hard to test, which then becomes low quality, and so forth. 
So some solutions to these problems of uh, asynchronousness, um, uh, one of which just just alluded to, which is not using uh, bare mm -hmm. weights. There's this library called Weight Utils. It's it's quite literally the world's most useful stupid piece of code you'll ever find. It is nothing but a bare loop which takes a predicate object and checks for that condition to go true. It sleeps for 100 milliseconds, waits to see, wakes up to see if a condition is true, goes to sleep for another 100 milliseconds. And it's like literally two methods, this library is two methods, and this will change the quality of your test suite. It will change the robustness of your test suite. Um, yeah? Are there any particular tools it works with? No, it's, it's, it's a Java library. You can throw it in and with anything that you're writing your tests in. So CV, you're writing your test harness in Java? Yeah. Okay. But I mean, you can reuse this. You can recreate this thing in any language that has pretty much got the ability to sleep and wait for a condition. Um, so it's really small. So very, you, can do it, you can do it in Ruby. You can do it in Python. Let me think. I mean, any language that accepts functions, you can do it. And any language that has got sleep, which is every language, uh, you can pretty much rewrite this code. If it's Turing complete, you can probably do it. You can probably do it. For Ajax-based tests, if your JavaScript framework provides a pre and post call hook, uh, re uh, reuse those, intercept those to count the number of active <coughs> calls you're making. What do I mean by this? If you're doing, if you're using, I don't know, jQuery, or if you're using prototype, uh, yeah, there's dollar dot Ajax. Every time you make it, um, wrap that function. Um, and uh, when you when you make that call, when you initiate a new JavaScript query, update a global variable that says uh, increment the count by one. And when that comes back, either successfully or fails, decrement that counter. And every time that counter is zero, you know that there are no pending um, outstanding JavaScript requests. So that's a very easy way to detect if all JavaScript activity is complete. And that's one way by which you can start Ajax operations, know when they finish, even when there might not be any visible changes to the page. And that's another way of preventing uh, random bare sleeps in your code. Uh, here's an example of how you would do it with, I think this is for prototype, uh, but you could do this sort of stuff with pretty much any framework. Don't worry if you can't read this, we've got the gist up there, it's up on GitHub, so you can always go and copy it from GitHub. And these slides are on the conference <coughs> website, so you can download the slides from the conference website. And get the links from there, all right? This is just, we didn't, we want to make sure that there was a pattern, we're not gonna really talk you through the code, we're sure, we're sure you can follow it. Um, so remember, um, Make time to go back and refactor your tests. Um, uh, use layers and encapsulation, uh, separate high-level intent and low-level mechanics, and uh, use the change <coughs> object to interact with the system under test, taking into account things that incur delays and, um, and uh, things that you think cannot necessarily be tested for, such as waiting for uh, stuff to appear or disappear on the page and Ajax activity, and don't use bare sleeps. Which brings us to principle number three. Continuously curate the structure of your test suites. So when you first start with a new application, your very first story has a mm, I want ding so that yay, and you'll have acceptance criteria for that thing, which is uh, given an existing state of the system, when I perform these actions, I expect this finishing state. <coughs> so you, know, you write your very first test suite, which tests this very first requirement, and you feel happy because you've got acceptance tests that pass that are automated, yay. Uh, but then, you know, over the course of the next several weeks, you have to do that a lot for all the new stories. And what you can end up with very easily is a test suite for every story. And that's a terribly bad thing to do because what happens is your test suite tells the story of the evolution of your system, not the story of how users interact with that system, which is a different thing. So what we propose instead is what's called journey tests. So remember, the test is supposed, the tests are supposed to interact with the system the same way that a user would. So how, what are the main business flows through your application? So imagine you're writing tests for Flipkart. Uh, you buy a product. So first you search the product catalog, you add the product to your cart, you check out, you create a new account, provide your address details, your credit card details, or you know, cash on delivery for Flipkart. Uh, you complete your order, verify that it's created, um, verify that an acknowledgement email is sent. That would be a user's path through the system. So you'd have a test suite for by product and test suites for other journeys through the system. So I have a new requirement or a new story. As a customer, I want a gift wrap option so that I don't have to wrap gifts and post them myself. So what do we do? Do we create a new test suite for this requirement? No. What we do is we look at the existing journeys and we see if instead we can modify an existing journey. So we would take this journey and modify it and add something to select the gift wrap option and verify that the order that was created has uh, the acknowledgement email says we will gift wrap your order and not include the invoice, for example. Right. So always try and diff 
existing journeys instead of creating new ones. And what that means is the testers have to work with the customer or the analyst to understand the journeys through the system. So the testers become really good at actually understanding the business value delivered by the system, which is another reason. And you know, testers will often have feedback on that to the analysts and to the developers. Yeah. Well, this actually won't work because the user would be doing this. So this is yet another reason why having testers outsourced or in a different room is a bad idea because you can't have these conversations and they're really important. So, you need to identify the main user journeys through your system. That's part of the analysis of creating maintainable test suites. Um, and a journey is the path that a persona takes through the application to, a, to solve a problem for that user. That's what a journey is. Most applications don't have a lot of personas. Um, and in fact, usually as part of an analysis effort to create a new uh, system, you'll actually identify one key persona and then maybe some alternative one. So if you've got tons of personas in your stories, that's a sign that something is wrong. Yeah. And at the beginning of development of a new system, you'll be creating uh, a bunch of <coughs> test suites. And then as the system evolves, you'll find you're creating fewer and fewer new test suites and instead changing existing test suites. Uh, so that's part of the evolution of the system. Uh, a good uh, a rough guide is, um, if your test suite increases in execution time by an order of magnitude, it means that your user should be able to do an order of magnitude things more in your system. So it's okay that when you start your application, it takes you two minutes, and when you finish uh, release two or three, it's at 20 minutes, because your, test, your uh, customer can g genuinely do 10 times more things uh, at release three than they did on the day you started. But if, or in year 10, your suite is at you know, 3,000 minutes, and your customer can really only do two new things at this point, two more new things at this point, then obviously there is a discrepancy between the amount of things a user can do and the amount of things your tests are testing, and that should be a key indicator when you have, uh, when you need to actually reconsider whether you're doing journeys properly. Uh, this is a concrete example, another concrete example. Um, we are running through this uh, very quickly. Um, and it is a bit hand wavy because it's a bit contrived. We wanted to take a very obvious example of something like Amazon or Flipkart. But if you want a slightly more concrete example, I had to do this exercise for the product I'm working on right now just yesterday. So contact me after the talk and we can talk about that as well. But for example, how do you weave uh, features and journeys in with each other? In an in a application that lists products, you may have searching as a feature and you may have pagination as a feature with each of their own requirements. So searching may have things like searching for a word, searching for a phrase, searching for a quoted phrase, should bring back words with everything, paginating results by page size, what happens before the first page, but after the last page. All of these things can be acceptance criteria at the individual story levels. But if you decide to automate each and every single one of these into your acceptance test suite, you're going to run into a problem. So that's what your story test would look like for each of those things. And there is a point where you might start with this because you don't have a full journey in your system. But very soon, you should be changing these into your journey test. And we can see, let's take a quick look at how we can do that. A journey of buying a book, however, would look something like this. A login as user Bob, search for, um, quote it, my friend's dead, make sure that three pages of results show up, verify that all my friends are dead by every Monson is on the first page, <coughs> add two copies of the book to your shopping cart, gift wrap one of them, and proceed to checkout. This is a really complete flow that actually tests what a user might do. It exercises the search functionality, it exercises the quoting part of the search functionality, it exercises that there are multiple pages of results that show up and therefore tests the pagination functionality. And when you put all of these together, it actually genuinely verifies that the benefit of searching, the benefit of pagination, and the benefit of being able to gift wrap, or gift wrap that book are all available to your customers rather than necessarily testing what happens if the user hacks the URL and types in page number 3008 because that's not particularly useful to find out at this level. And this is why testing, having the testing role and the testing skill is really important because developers <coughs> often don't understand how to do this. Knowing how to do this is a skill and it's something that testers are really good at. Um, yeah. So uh, solutions, uh, just to recap. Extract journeys from your acceptance test. You may start out with story level tests. There is a time and place in order to, in order to uh, curate your story level tests into something larger, your journey tests. Um, make them fast and make them run first. Put your journey test before the huge big bulk of your, um, end, uh, of your negative tests, of your test that tests what happens when the user hacks the UI, what happens when somebody inserts uh, vague SQL-like characters into my form fields. Do I have SQL injection tags? Do I have JavaScript injection tags? All those negative tests can go into a separate suite that runs after your journey test. 
these deliver quick value and tell you very quickly whether any key user functionality is broken and you want to get that feedback fast. And sorry, the other thing I wanted to say is that exploratory testing will often change journey tests. So yeah. testers will change these tests in response to exploratory testing they do, and the journey tests that exist will be reused as part of exploratory testing as well. So there's an interaction between the exploratory testing activity and the way the user journeys work. Yep, you may want to uh, automate like 90% of your actual journey and then stop at that point and test like two or three alternate parts that are less likely but have proven to be fragile in the recent past, finish that up manually and then continue your journey test from that point on as an example of what you might want to do. Um, Test the most likely parts in the journey tests. Uh, do not test every possible path through the system because then you'll just have a test that's a test suite that runs forever. And extract negative tests in edge cases into a regression suite that runs after your journey test. Have them, run them, pay attention to them, but don't put yourself into, into the grindhouse of thinking that every single test that you possibly write has got to run uh, right at the start and run with every check-in. Make sure that you can pull the most valuable tests first and get feedback from them first before proceeding. So uh, my favorite quote about quality is from this guy, W. Edwards Deming, who's very famous, one of the people who helped create the lean movement in Japan after the Second World War. And he was working in manufacturing, but he has this to say about quality. <coughs> Cease dependence on mass inspection to achieve quality. Improve the process and build quality into the products in the first place. This is my favorite quote about quality, and it has two important implications for testing. Number one, testing is not something we do after dev complete. Testing is something we do all the time. The quickest way to fix a bug and the cheapest way to fix a bug is don't check it into version control in the first place. That's why we have unit tests that we run before we check in. The second implication is the testers are not responsible for quality. Everyone is responsible for quality. And the reason for that is quality is a business decision. You may decide that it's okay to sacrifice quality for time to market and get a product to your users quickly that is of lesser quality. That may be a valid business decision. I mean, for example, Microsoft Office would be an example of, of, of such a strategy. Um, or you may decide that quality is very important to your customers and you want to sacrifice time to market in order to have high quality. It's a business decision. And that's why it's a decision that the whole team has to make. Testers are not responsible for quality. Everyone is, which leads to our fourth principle, which is that everyone owns acceptance tests. If the acceptance tests break, it's not the tester's problem to triage it. When the acceptance tests break, what should happen is developer, a developer and a tester should triage that problem together and then work out what to do. So what do we do when an acceptance test break? First, you need to find out why. There's four possible root causes. You could have a flaky test environment. The application may not be deployed properly. There might be a configuration setting wrong. Number two, there could be a bug in the actual test. So you might, um, there, there might be something that you have to fix in the test. Number three, maybe your assumptions <coughs> changed. Maybe the system evolved. We changed a requirement, and because we changed the, the system in response to that requirement change, the assumptions of the test are no longer correct, and so we need to change the test. Or, number four, Maybe the test actually caught a bug. <laughs> that would be fabulous. So, the first thing you have to do once you've triaged the problem is fix it. Um, and then, crucially, you have to add a guard to prevent that problem from happening again. So, if the problem was environmental, that means you have a configuration management problem. You need to make it so that you can provision a testing environment automatically using information from version control so that test environment provisioning is a push button, reliable, repeatable process. If it's a bug with the test, then you need to, um, well, I, I guess the, the, the main thing with all these things is this. If your acceptance tests are failing all the time, that means that your unit tests are not good enough. So there's a feedback loop. If you've got good unit test suites, you should find that your acceptance tests fail rarely. And when you have an acceptance test failure, what that means is there's a missing unit test. So the first thing you do once you fix your acceptance test is write a unit test to make sure that, that, that the acceptance test won't break again in response to that. So what we're doing is um, optimizing our test suite to detect failures fast, which means running the unit test first and paralyzing the automated tests, but optimizing our process for time to fix tests, which means that we need to make sure that we if we find a problem, we put the guard in as soon as possible to make sure that that problem doesn't occur again. There's, there's one more condition, right? Your 
your acceptance test passed. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it should have failed. Oh. Right. So if you accept, which brings us on to the next thing, which is intermittent failure. So thank you for that fabulous setup. Um, one of the biggest problems with acceptance tests is the test pass, uh, you run it again, the test fails. Or the test fails and you're like, oh, well, it's a flaky test. I'm going to run the test suite again. Oh, it passes now. Um, so that's a great example of where you know, the test passing, you don't necessarily have confidence that that means there's actually, that the system is reliable. Maybe it should have actually failed. Um, so flaky tests, people like to say flaky tests are useless. Flaky tests are worse than useless because they cause you to lose confidence in the test suite. You don't trust the test suite anymore. And that means that people don't pay attention to it, which means that it rots. So what do we do when we have an infection? Um, when somebody becomes infected with a disease, what we do is we put them in quarantine. Yay, quarantine. And we should do the same thing with flaky tests. We have a separate um, test suite, which is, or separate run of tests, which is for flaky tests. So if you have a deployment pipeline, you have a separate stage to run all the flaky tests. Um, and so what that means is when the non-flaky tests fail, that means I'm paying attention. I think there's a real bug. If the quarantine suite fails, uh, I don't really care. But the crucial thing is to monitor the proportion of tests in the quarantine suite. If all your tests are in the quarantine suite, <laughs> <laughs> that's bad. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail. There's more causes of intermittency. Martin Fowler has an article on non-determinism in tests. It can be caused by dependencies between tests, by things like memory problems. So in some cases, flakiness is actually due to real problems with the application. Um, I will briefly talk about external systems, which is another cause of test flakiness. If your system has to interact with another system, uh, that can cause flaky tests. So a well-designed system should not have all tests calling the external system. Uh, what you can do instead is put in um, a proxy. Uh, so I'm going to brief. I'm, I'm going to skip straight to this because yep. that's the important bit. Um, what you do is, I mean, there's no problem in computer science that can't be solved with an additional layer of abstraction. <laughs> so what you do is, between your system under test and any external dependencies, you put an abstraction layer. And what that abstraction layer is, is it could either pass those calls to the system under test, or it could call a mock or a stub, which simulates it, or you could have um, a proxy. <coughs> and what we've used this pattern successfully before, um, the abstraction layer is a proxy, and what it does is, you run the integration tests against the real external system, but you record the calls and you record the responses and save them in a flat text file. Uh, it's the simplest thing to do, or maybe in a database if you want to get clever. Um, and then what you do um, is run those integration smoke tests before you run the acceptance test suite. Um, actually, maybe you better finish this. Yeah, I mean, no, that's exactly what you're saying. I mean, like, if, for example, if you've got a tax system that returns tax codes, um, it's not exactly every day that the tax codes for, I don't know, pick Alabama, that the tax codes for Alabama are going to change. They've got a really weird tax code system in the US for that one state. I don't know. Um, so, but the fact is, if you recorded that request once and then had a copy of it, there's absolutely no reason why you can't reuse that in your test suite until such time as you know for a fact that the tax code system is going to return different data to you. So a recording proxy in places like this really helps and periodically <coughs> expire the cache, run the tests against, uh, 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 against the real system uh, once in a while to make sure that you have the latest copy of the data and this would prevent you from actually making the third party system call every time um, and run the acceptance test suite only if the integration suites fail so you're going to have a small number of integration tests that actually make the real call to the system um, run those first to make sure that everything is working fine over there and if those run green then run the rest of your acceptance test suite um, which brings us down to principle number five, because most often, um, acceptance, uh, which is that acceptance test suites are responsible for managing their own data. And the reason this segues from the previous one is because a lot of times data does come from external systems. And in order to be reliable, this data needs to have certain qualities, such as. So there's three different kinds of test data. Test specific data is data whose state we verify at the end of the test. So if you're testing buying a product, you would verify that the person's account have been debited. There's also test reference data, which is data you need for the test to run, but you don't validate the state at the end. So you don't validate the user's address at the end of the test to find out if they bought the product successfully. But you would need to set up the user with an address in order to run the test. 
And finally, application reference data, which is data required for the system to start up, like country codes or tax codes, but you know, it's not actually set up as part of the test suite. So it's really important to ensure that our tests can run independently of each other for two reasons. Firstly, we want to be able to run our test suites in parallel so that we can run them faster. Secondly, if your tests are coupled to each other, so if, I, if test one sets up the data for test two, which sets up the data for test three, what happens if I change test one because I have a new requirement or because something changes? Maybe test three breaks because the data that test three was expecting is no longer there. So if you have dependencies between tests, it can cause flakiness and intermittent test failures. It, can also, it also means you can't run your tests in parallel. So it's really bad. And the way to solve that problem is have tests set up their own data. And what you should find is, if you're writing good journey tests, that happens automatically. Uh, in the process of doing um, this journey test that Budgie showed earlier, I have to create a user bot, and I log in as that user, and I'm actually creating the state as I go along for the test. But this <laughs> test should create its own state. It should have no dependency on data that I've already created in the system, either as part of setup or as part of another test. And in particular, what's really vital is that you don't use production data dumps uh, as the basis for running tests. So we should not be running data directly into the database before we run acceptance tests. Acceptance tests should set up their own data because it becomes really hard to manage those production data dumps and it increases the time it takes to run the tests. So in conclusion, treat your acceptance tests like production <coughs> code. Always interact with the, well these are the principles. Always interact with the system under test like a user would. Continuously create your user journeys. Acceptance tests are owned by everyone and they should manage their own data. And the takeaways that we presented at the beginning, quality is everyone's responsibility. It's a business requirement. It's not just the testers. We create maintainable test suites by continuously curating our journeys, having testers and developers and users working together on that curation process. We need to treat our test code with the same care as production code using encapsulation, refactoring, source control, all these other things we use to manage our production code. And finally, Story level testing is not a good basis for the creation of maintainable acceptance tests. You need to think about user journeys uh, and how users interact with the system. At the conference, uh, if you want to talk to me about um, those uh, those journeys that I created yesterday or any other patterns or like things like that, you can reach out to us. So feel free to bother us with questions, but we'll let you go now because it's the end of the talk.